All right, well, we are so thrilled to be here as part of this special online at home version of the International Agatha Christie Festival. I, uh, up here in this corner, am Kemper Donovan, co-host of the All About Agatha podcast. And with me uh, in the opposite upper corner is my co-host, Catherine Brobeck. Hi. <laughs> and we are um, so excited to be interviewing Agatha Christie biographer, Laura Thompson. Hello. Hi. Absolute <laughs> pleasure. Thank you. So um, just to give a little context of, of who we are for anyone who might not know, um, Catherine and I uh, co-host a podcast called All About Agatha, and it is dedicated to all things Agatha Christie related. Um, we've structured it around a chronological review of every single novel that our beloved Dame Agatha published. And we're even trying to rank all of them, fool's errand though that may be. Uh, it's probably worth noting that at the time of recording, we have covered 47 of her 66 novels up to and including Hickory Dickory Dock. So just to get that out of the way. And Laura is much easier to explain. She wrote a fantastic biography of Agatha Christie that we reference all the time on our podcast. We use it time and time again, um, <laughs> which is why we're so excited uh, to be interviewing you now. And I just wanna say at the outset, uh, I will gush a little bit and then we can move on to things more substantive, but we really are such fans of the um, of the book. And, you know, I just want to say right now for anyone who hasn't picked it up yet, that it's a fantastic read. And I, what I particularly love that you do in it is that you tell a story. It's not just an assemblage of facts. It's, you know, the story of Agatha Christie's life. And it's just as much of a page turner, honestly, um, as a Christie novel. So um, you do that plus, of course, presenting the wealth of information that we've come to expect from biographies. So I just want to say, you know, Congrats and thank you for just a generally beautifully written book that we find uh, so useful. Oh, Kemper. Oh, my God. That's, I mean, that is so beautiful. Really, I really appreciate it because you guys, you know, you know your stuff and um, pray, I'd rather have praise from, from you than, than, than almost anybody. So that's absolutely <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, <laughs> yeah, I always think it's good to get the gushing out of the way. It kind of sets a nice. No, no, you gush. I love gush. <laughs> and then we can ask the really tough questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I think first off, uh, we're, we're, we're curious how you came to write this book because you are a biographer. This was not your first biography. And um, it, my guess would be that you were, have been a lifelong fan of Christie. But just what is your, you know, relationship with Agatha mm -hmm. Christie? Absolutely. I'd only written one biography before, actually. And before that, I'd been writing about horses, horse racing. You know, I mean, it was a leap. It was a big leap. <laughs> but um, I remember I was on holiday in Devon um, with a boyfriend. Um, I don't speak to him anymore, but that's <laughs> gave me the idea. He gave me the idea. It was extraordinary. We were kind of walking around. He, um, his mother lived quite near where you cross over to get to Burr Island. And I was looking at the sea, looking at the landscape, and I couldn't get Agatha out of my mind. And it's extraordinary because she doesn't really describe. And yet you are in this mysterious way she has, you are aware of a sense of place and how she does it, nobody knows because it's completely kind of translucent. She doesn't appear to describe, but you are aware. So I couldn't get her out of my head. And this guy said to me, well, you should write her biography. Um, I knew that Janet Morgan, of course, had done hers. Um, brilliant source, total respect for Janet's book. But I, it, was, um, it was nearly 20 years on, and I thought there was room for another one. And I got very, very lucky. You know, Matthew Pritchard kind of gave me the thumbs up. And he said, go and talk to my mother. So I went and talked to Rosalind, um, petrified, you know, to turn up at the Greenway House when it was still Rosalind and her husband still lived there. Oh my God, I've never been so frightened and nervous. And she was absolutely wonderful. She was absolutely wonderful. And I think, you know, I'm interested to know how it was in America because in 2003 in this country, her reputation was not all that great. You know, she was kind of, when I read English at university and of course in between, um, you know, whatever, Hardy and Dickens, I'd slope off with the murder on the Orient Express and keep that very <laughs> very much under my hat. Now, 
you might be studying her at university for all I know. You know, her reputation has, has um, and, and good, we, we love that. But in 2003, not so much. And I kind of thought, this woman is, it's like the Beatles. You can't imagine life without her. But because of that, she's taken for granted. And I wanted to go behind what, what, what is the nature of her genius. And, um, you know, sort of without overdoing it, try and tease out what makes her so great because I didn't feel anyone had really done that before. Now, now they have, of course, but it was a bit, at the time, a bit revisionist. And it was, yes, came from a, a total place of love from 10 year old looking at my mother's copy of Murder on the Links or whatever, and just being completely lost, like I imagine you guys. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, I, I think that's, um, that's such an important part of, of the story, I think, because we almost forget now in 2020 that it was quite recent that I think Christy wasn't really regarded as much of anything other than a guilty pleasure. And, and let's be honest, there's still many, many people who have that opinion. None of you know, the people on in this interview or probably who are listening or watching this interview uh, agree with that, which is why we're all here. But, um, and I think you, you go, um, you, you take, you know, such strides in explaining why that is ridiculous and, you know, what Christy um, does so well, which is, you know, something that we're, it's kind of the raison d'etre of, of our podcast as well, because that was part of, you know, what we thought as we were starting this, that this is an author who does not often get the thorough kind of literary analysis and treatment that she deserves. So let's try to contribute to that within the podcast medium, however we can. And, um, you know, I would say, and this is, a, this is Catherine, I'm cueing you to come in here because I'm about to bring up Five Little Pigs. But I think that the fact that we all hold Five Little Pigs in such high regard is proof that we all are thinking about Christy in the same way. Because it's one of the things that I so appreciated about your book. You clearly love Five Little Pigs. And I'll just tell you, Laura, that Five Little Pigs is actually our number one ranked. Oh, stop it. Yeah. Oh, my God. This is a whole thing. There's a whole Five Little Pigs, you know society it's incredible <laughs> really? oh guys i total you know total respect well you know how much i love it but um it, and and i didn't realize you know i'd read it probably when i was about 15 probably the age that um angela is at the start and thought oh this is good this is clever and then when i read it again i thought oh my god this is a very particular kind of genius um it kind of goes to your point. Yeah, go on, Catherine. Sorry. You no, know, it kind of goes a bit to your point. I, I think it's, we've talked about this a little bit on the podcast, but that book in particular, when you were talking about how at university, um, mystery in general, I think, is often just written out of the canon. Um, there's a bias towards genre. And I mean, I think you can make the argument that all fiction has an element of mystery in it, right? Otherwise, what, what is the story that you're telling? But because popular fiction like Christie sort of gets shunted off to one side, I think the interesting element of Five Little Pigs is that it's extremely literary, right? You know, it's, it's, it's doing something structurally fascinating. It's doing something interesting with characters. It's actually falling into, oddly enough, um, what we would consider literary canon closer than, you know, sort of um, um, some of the other books as, in, as inventive as they are. So I do think it's a little funny that that is like, I mean, it's a desert island book for me. So, you know. It's very interesting. It's very, and it's very interesting what you say about, because I can remember um, P.D. James, who I spoke to for the book, her, her famous analysis of Emma as a detective, a piece of detective fiction. And of course that moment she should marry, Mr. Knightley should marry no one but herself, is pure kind of Christie rush of everything falling into place. That's so true. Um, I think The Hollow as well possibly strays into that, but I don't know if other people share that view. As a, as a mystery, it's, it's, it's slim, it's slimmer than Five Little Pigs. But the sheer beauty of the characterization and yeah um yeah. and the in our top 10 for sure <laughs> the, the hollow really oh uh, we're yeah. we're so on the same page guys um this is you know um it's that it's when plot and character synthesize which i think they do at, at, to the at the highest degree in fly pigs and the 
you know, it almost brought tears to my eyes, the slotting into place of why Caroline does this. And, you know, um, and, and, the, and, the, and of course, the nature of art versus love, art versus reality, which is, which is really powerful in that book. And the character of, um, I never know how you say his name, Amias, Amias Crail, that's a hell of a character. That's, you know, it's like I say in the book, you could turn them around the other way, expand them, and you would have a very serious novel there. But the fact that she can distill it is like Proust, of what, it's not Proust, but somebody said, I wrote a long book, I didn't have time to write a short one. The fact that she can okay. distill and say that much in, what are they, 80,000 words or something? I don't know anyone else who can do that. There may be people, I don't know. The most interesting thing about that too is that Amnes Crail is not a character in the book. You don't get Amnes, you know, you get everybody's memory of Amnes and to have such a distinctive character that you are literally only seeing through other people's sort of present memory of him and yet have such a force off the page. I mean, I hadn't read it for some time, um, until we did it for the podcast and I remembered I mean every detail of it so you know to have that sort of punch years later is really masterful that's is that is it, it something that struck me when I updated it because it came out again this year when I updated it I realized just how theatrical her thinking is you know that bit when Elsa remembers him coming up to her and saying god I'd love to paint you or something you I'm sure you know the proper word, uh, what he actually said, Catherine, but the, the way, it's what you say, it's like Poirot, the, 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 the life on the page, it's not depth so much as absolute life, right. and that, which I think some people have mistaken, well, in my view, for um, simplicity, in, in a, i.e. too simple, but in fact there's so much depth beneath it, but it is, uh, they're, they're so scenic her books and of course she loved theatre and of course she wrote plays although I think her books are far better than her plays but if you you can take the scenes um and that's why in a way although I understand why people like to adapt them for television and do all sorts of things with them actually if you took them from the page to the telly and didn't do anything to them I think they would work perfectly probably best of all because her imagination is so she thinks in scenes, character in action. You know that bit in Cards on the Table when Anne Meredith, he wants to find out if she's a thief and he asks her to her house, Poirot, he asks her to his flat, sorry, and she steals stockings. Mm -hmm. And you know everything about that girl from that scene. And it's kind of, she, he, she's not told you anything, she's just shown you, Agatha, her stealing a couple of pairs of stockings. And I always think that's quite brilliant as an example of character in action. And I mean, I'm sure other novelists can do it, but I don't know anyone who does it with quite such um, concision and punch, as you said, and vitality and immediacy, you know? And, and just sheer readability. I mean, oh. that's, that's the thing that I think um, people forget because I think so many people that, that are you know, fans of mystery actually only read Agatha Christie. And they don't realize if you start reading other, especially golden age authors, most of them are, are nigh impossible to get through. I mean, that's, that, that's a bold <laughs> statement. I'll get some people you know, angry at me for saying that, but a lot of them, many, many of them, I would ar even argue most of them are nowhere near as readable as she is. Even in you know, the books that we've ranked the lowest, it's rare that it's difficult to get through a Christie. And I think that's such an easy thing to overlook and not give its, its full due because that's writing. I mean, if, what, what isn't the, you know, the art of the craft other than making something easy, easy to read and absorb and digest? And she does it every single time. It's amazing. Absolutely. She sometimes reminds me of like a, a bee going from flower to flower. She, she draws your eye to the salient point every time, every time. And if you look at her notebooks, you can see the salient points are kind of, and she's got the whole book in microcosm sometimes. But that, because she is such an interesting writer, because she is, obviously she watched it, she worked like crazy at those plots, but she is instinctual um, 
in a way that and whenever people tried to give her advice she very politely you know chucked it out the window like her second husband saying oh you must learn to use a semicolon you know <laughs> yeah right um the, the, well, go back um, to your archaeological book <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly um but the, the, what you say about the readability there's such a, a speed and a zest that is um and a, and a, and a, an instinctive knowledge of what you need to know next and what you, and what will tell you what I, you know when i started analyzing it i nearly my brain nearly exploded at the at the, at, yes at the it's in, instinctive nature because i mean she didn't she wasn't going to be a writer she was going to be an opera singer that was what she wanted to do uh -huh. and um and again theatrical kind of theatrical sensibility and a knowledge of what you need from moment to moment in it to keep your attention as it were visually almost um but to have even in styles which is you know obviously she improved it's all there it's all there that bit when he um he says Poirot you you adjusted the jars or something and made them symmetrical and of course that's where the clue is and again you've got character in action in that you know, I mean, come on. And I know what you mean about the, I mean, I love um, Sayers and Josephine Tay, and I do, I do really love those people, but they are massively prolix by comparison. Yeah, Dorothy mm -hmm. says it takes 400 pages to make a, a plot point that our girl is doing, you know, four lines probably. It's, um, <laughs> it's, but it's a, yeah, I mean, it's a completely different thing, but um, it's, do you, are you not, is it just Agatha for you? Are you not? fans so much of these other we're i mean we're personally fans of of you know many many mystery authors both golden age contemporary all across the board mm -hmm. the the podcast is is solely devoted to christy because there's yeah. so much there there's so much material but um but yes we're you know it's funny i just when you were talking about the performative aspect of her writing i never yeah. thought to put it this way but and i'm i'm curious to get your opinion on this but one of the things that struck me in her autobiography, I'm also a huge personal fan of Christie's autobiography. Catherine mm. makes fun of me about it. I make, I make fun because, you know, I also enjoy it and I'm sure our listeners enjoy the tidbits from it as well. But yes, Kemper is a huge fan of the autobiography. It might be my favorite Christie. If I had to choose How my favorite Christie, I might, I might say it's the autobiography. Um, fascinating for both what it says and what it doesn't, right? Um, but one thing that she says in there that always struck me <laughs> as a, uh, an, an amateur uh, musician who struggles uh, a lot as well, you'll actually see the music stand in the corner there. With oh the little my fire. goodness, how lovely. Um, I'm terrible. But uh, she talks in, in her book about, you know, she trained to be a concert pianist and she was singing and she had this one disastrous concert where her, her teacher in Paris said, you know, maybe this just isn't your, your thing. You're kind of not built to perform. And she said what was awful about it is she had the technique. She practiced for hours, but it was as though her body was betraying her. And I know exactly what she means. It's that kind of the adrenaline rush comes in. You start shaking. All of your practice goes out the window. Your technique yeah. is shot. And it's, but it's almost as though she was a born performer. So what she did is that she channeled all of her performative instincts into her writing so yeah. that her body didn't have to be a part of it because she was writing, but you can feel that performer's instinct in there. I, yes, that's, that puts it beautifully. That's, that's absolutely right. I mean, she was um, not perhaps as introverted as the legend has it in a way. Sure. It's very sure. much a post-1926 thing, the introversion completely understandably, but, but she's not a performer in, in that way. No, it's, although she did, she sang, was it Yona the Guard or something and said it was the happiest thing she'd ever done when she was a girl. She was a very confident girl. It's, it's, um, she is a, she is, um, well, inevitably anyone that intelligent is very, very complex. But, but, but yes, I, I completely agree with you. And what, it, I don't know if you've ever read her first novel, the unpublished, um, Snow Upon the Desert. Mm -mm. Um, she wrote when she was 19 or something like that from when she came out as a debutante in Egypt and was observing all the characters and I found a typescript of it at Greenway and it's it's so interesting because the plot's all over the place but the gift for character is absolutely spot on and of course 
the conventional view has always became, oh, she's so good at plots, but oh, her characters, they're just like marionettes. And of course, we take a completely different view, which I think has now, you know, taken a hold that she can do characters. She just does it in her way, in her this distilled way. Mm -hmm. But the gift for character seemed to me to come before the gift for plot. Um, she must have just found that the genre suited her. I think um, there's something to be said about the theater background of it because and her interest in performance, because if you think about how theater works, right? Um, stage directions are the streamlining of a plot, right? So the providing the information necessary to structure it, to give the sort of most amount of information to the creative team and the actors to guide the plot, whereas most of the information that you're getting on stage has to come out of character development, right? It has to come out of interaction between the other players on the stage. So there is something interesting in about her efficiency actually seeming to relate a lot to the interest in performance because by necessity, um, performance is a streamlining of narrative, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a very good point. I mean, what do you think of her plays as, as, as a general thing, or do you not examine those in the same way? Or we ha We've been going through them. I mean, I think some of them succeed better than others. You can see why they have been so consistently popular amongst, you know, troops, yeah. Um, worldwide, they're they're very accessible. Um, I don't know how successful some of them are from like a literary or theatrical merit standpoint. Certainly, um, my preference is for her novels. But yeah, yeah, you know, would you would you you feel the same, Kemper? Presumably, I mean, yeah, I do. I mean, I think it's it's interesting. We um we've been we've actually covered um. We, we we run a separate Patreon account, and and on that we're covering a lot of her plays because the podcast is more squarely about her novels. And um, oh. the one thing that I think it's 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 useful to make a distinction between her original plays and her adapted plays. Absolutely, because, mm. right? Because I do think that um, when it came to adapting her novels, and it's almost as if she was doing that. It seems a lot of times at like he a heading off at the pass of the whole issue of adaptation when it came to movies and film that that was a little bit you know her motive her motivation and mm -hmm. those i think it's i think it's rare to find an example where the play adaptation is more interesting or robust than the novel upon which it was based which really seems to be her medium but she did you know uh we actually just finished covering spider's web which is it, you know, it 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 definitely feels like an example of a mid-century play. It doesn't necessarily feel modern, but it's a lot of fun, and it and it sort of has that Christie flair to it, um, in a way that I think uh, surprised us or at least charmed us, um, yeah. especially when you're comparing it to some more of of her ad adaptational um, plays. And I think you even made this point in your book that um, Witness for the Prosecution is probably you know her most successful stage play and it's so different from the short you know not slight but but short short story that it's based on that that yes. almost feels as if it's an original play as well you could almost count it in that category yeah i agree totally agree it's funny the I, I agree about spider's web she could be very funny i don't think she's always given enough credit for that her Absolutely. the droll Sometimes her narrative voice, I always think of the moving finger, it's a very droll narrative voice, you know, it's lovely. Um, uh, but um, the, the adapted ones, the, the adaptation of Five Little Pigs, you sort of think, gosh, you know, it's almost like, I, I think you're right, she's forestalling anyone else, you know, because it's, it's almost like she doesn't realize what's so great about that book, because <laughs> it's just pure, <laughs> it's just pure, you know, Sit in the interval with your with your gin and tonic and your box of whatever in the play, and it's it's just pure um, night at the theatre for a jolly couple of hours. Whereas the book, you know, we think is a masterpiece. So so yes, and, and the whole adaptation thing is very very interesting. Um, and she loved the film of Witness, didn't she? Which um, I don't know. It's 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 good. Um, I, I always, as I say, I always feel um, with, I always feel with her adaptations, 
I'd almost love to see something that just sticks absolutely to what she wrote. <laughs> Brilliantly acted, like, and then there were none. Just do it absolutely what she wrote with some of the best actors. And I think you would just, you'd just be blown away. You'd just be blown away. It happens surprisingly rarely because even though the Suchet series adaptations are faithful, largely, <laughs> largely, largely, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, it's surprising. You know, there there are very few, I think, and then there were nuns which really stick to, you know, actually what she wrote. I mean, I think maybe the Russian one, Kemper, would you say, is the closest to being a completely direct adaptation. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there and well, we have, we have these sort of you know there. Are, I'm I, I was going to ask about this. I, I I might as well ask now. I'm curious where where you fall on the new BBC adaptations of Christie. You know, most not not necessarily all have been adapted by Sarah Phelps, mm. who is obviously like a, you know an amazingly talented writer. And I think those yeah. adaptations are doing something interesting, but they have you know. Um, they have their fans, but they also have their major detractors. They're they're a little bit of a, um, you know, a, a contentious subject among, mm. among Christie fans and scholars. I'm curious how you feel about them. Well, I think it's it, it is really interesting because I think what they do, and she, she is extremely gifted, but what they do, which I like, they kind of take her seriously. They kind of take Agatha seriously. They she she Sarah Phelps, from what I would infer perceives a wealth of depth within Christie's books that she thinks is worth excavating. So you haven't got the, you know, some of the earlier twee and twinkly, here's my Art Deco um, backdrop, and uh, you know, here's a perfect car from 1930 that I hired for the day. That's, um, so in a way, I'd rather have what Sarah Phelps does. In another way, um, I suppose what I really feel is what what I love about Agatha is um, she's nuanced and she's a sophisticate about human nature. I really love that about her. I love in the hollow that the affair between Henrietta and John is ne it's not just that she thinks it's okay. It's just never an issue that it's going on, that there's adultery here, that Henrietta is really good friends with her lover's wife. There's not a breath of judgment. It's not, it's not even thought of that there might be judgment. I love that about her. I love her sophistication and her adultness, if that's a word. And um, for example, Ordeal by Innocence, I think the solution of the book of Ordeal by Innocence is great. He is so grown up. It's so on the money. So I would rather have that than a made up solution that is making a kind of political, they're politicized, they're politicized and I'm not so much keen on that. Um, Agatha is, she's, she's, she's full of ideas, she's full of, you know, responses to the 20th century, the, 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 you know, some of her books are very engaged with politics, but she is not a politicized writer. So I suppose I think, although that's modern and what people do today, I suppose I think she is best addressed through character rather than um, some sort of layer of politicized thinking on the top, which was not her way at all. Um, I, th I do feel there's a happy medium between the Twee and Twinkly Art Deco and the, I'm going to make this into, you know, a kind of um, 21st century make a statement about the European Union or something. There is a there there is a medium, a happy medium, um, which I think works best. Like some of the early twenty first century ones, there was a brilliant Mrs. McGinty's Dead. There was a brilliant um, Mystery of the Blue Train. You know, I but that's that's just me. I don't um, you know I don't know. What do you guys think? My um, I I said this in an in, in episode somewhere at some point, but my. Uh, succinct way of of putting my my feelings sometimes about the Sarah Phelps adaptations, and this is going to come across as as a as a sick burn, uh, but I really don't mean it that way because I do respect so much of of what she does, which is taking Christie seriously. But to me, sometimes it strikes me as though the adaptations were written by Raymond West. By sorry, who? <laughs> by, by Raymond West, Miss Marple's nephew. Oh, that's hilarious. Do you know what I, I mean? Wish I could. 
I wish I'd said that. <laughs> like, I think that Christy, because I was trying to imagine, I was like, well, what would Agatha Christie think about this? And it came off of this specific quote that Sarah Phelps had made where she said, well, I think what I'm doing is that I'm dealing with the topics that Agatha Christie would have dealt with if she mm. could have. And that mm. I immediately, that was a red flag to me because for the reason that you're saying, she does deal with the topics she wants to deal with and very uncomfortable ones at that when she feels that they're appropriate, such as adultery, which, you know, is it was a big one back then, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that didn't ring true to me. And then I was thinking, it, it almost sometimes feels as though, okay, we're gonna be super serious and super dark and show you how bad everything is. And there's so many examples in the Miss Marple verse of Miss Marple kind of twinkling her eyes at Raymond and saying, oh, oh, you and your serious books, yes, you you know how, how dark and, and depressing the world really is. But actually, people are kind of silly and weird and unusual. And you might not actually be understanding things or be as perceptive about the world as you think you are. I could just imagine her having that take. It, obviously, I have, I have, you know, no idea, just as we all do, what Agatha Christie would have reacted to anything. But I can't help feeling as though there may be some truth to that. I think that's absolute genius. There is, I think it's in a Caribbean mystery, which I love a Caribbean mystery. I think it's very underrated. And she says something like Miss Marple, people like Raymond were so ignorant <laughs> because she says there's, there's sins that even clever young men from Oxford or whatever didn't, didn't know about. Um, I was thinking about Nemesis actually and thinking how incredibly dark that is. And I mean, it's a very late book, you know, it's a little bit obviously spoken into a dictaphone, a little bit, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But in a way, I prefer that they're not edited. I like that you're hearing her voice almost. Um, God, that's a dark book. And it, I feel it flatters the reader more to be sort of um, presented with these things and allowed to, you know, um, rise to the occasion of, of, of perceiving this sin without being shocked or without without thinking it's actually all that much out of the ordinary. I mean, murder is out of the ordinary. I know she pretends it isn't, but it is. But, but motive and the darkness that provokes these murders is terribly common. And I, and I like her ease with that and her, her, her odd, what is it Miss Marple says, she um, hopes for the best, but thinks the worst of everybody. And that I think is, yeah, I think that's about right. I think thinking the worst is probably quite a good plan actually. And in some ways today, we're much more naive about that. Much more easily shocked, you know. Um, I, I, much more easily shocked about things like adultery and um, well, there are hints of incest in a couple of them and that, and, and that kind of thing. I think, um, I think she's, I, I love the broadness of her mind and the, it, it, the wisdom with which she treats these things. So I would, I, I would love, I love the adaptations that kind of take that tone from her. Well, there's like, um, and I like that it's made against her a lot that sometimes the books are bloodless. Mm. It's not, it's not graphic depictions, I guess, of like bodies, but that's, first of all, not entirely true. And um, mm. secondly, I don't know that you have to spell it out. I don't know that you have to have, you know, some sort of grisly, um, you know, there are some contemporary writers who just seem to take real pleasure in describing the gore of something. And, you know, again, it's not, it's a little bit like how you were talking about her uh, depictions of landscape and, you know, the sense of place and like Devon, et cetera, and that you can get it through the cracks. Yeah. And it's almost more effective than spelling it out, right? It's more effective than having sort of Raymond West purple prose. I'd love to read one of his books. I can oh just... <laughs> Oh he probably God. won the Booker Prize by now. I mean, it's, you know, I can just imagine what they're like. You win a Nobel. <laughs> Pulitzer. Yeah, Nobel. why not? <laughs> send Miss Marple on an even better holiday, yeah. But, but yes, I, I mean, again, I'm being, trying to be very careful not to give anything away, but like Endless Night. My goodness, my goodness, that's dark. And my goodness. That, the other thing that always strikes me about her, which I'm sure you've talked about, is... Um, Again, this has kind of gone out the window, but when I started, you know, I first got the idea in 2003, so it's 
you know, quite a lot's happened since. Um, the idea of this, again, the, 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 that she lived in this kind of world of, or, and her books, uh, where it's eternally a bridge party and strychnine in the crumpets and there's the vicar and, you know, so on and so forth and uh, hierarchies and snobbery and any cliche you care to throw at her. And I can remember doing a radio interview when I was writing the book. And my God, there were two crime novelists on who I won't name. I thought they were gonna kind of kill me for thinking well of her. You know, they thought it was so ridiculous that I thought well of her. They just kept saying, oh no, she's fine, but she's awful, you know, all this kind of thing. Um, and thank no, God. I <laughs> Okay, <laughs> Cecile. But um, luckily, the landscape has changed a bit since then. But um, I just this idea that she didn't that she's it, it fossilized in some way. I mean, when you read a book like um, I don't know if you've got to this one. I can't remember. You got Destination Unknown or um, these yes. books that people don't <laughs> seem to like that much. I think that's absolutely great. It's a silly ending, but you know, there's a hell of a lot of um, thought and, and a kind of life philosophy in that book really. She was very uh, repelled by ideology of course and lived in a century you know driven by it but the way she covers her century and and the way the books change after the war and the way you know um, uh, the, 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 the servant thing which some people say is a snobbery thing but actually as you know from her autobiography she worships the servants at her childhood home and that, that, that obviously they form part, they're very useful for plot because they formalize life and in pocket full of rice, she must have been killed at this time, otherwise she'd have taken the second tea tray in. You know, that kind of thing you can't have in a more dislocated universe. But I love the way she, uh, uh, like in a book like Murder is Announced, all they can think about is, oh my God, can we get a good home help? And because people are like that and you can call it snobbery and you can, throw all sorts of um, the kind of accusations that, you know, get thrown around today, you can throw at her. But of course, people are of their time. And she really is a kind of oblique social historian of the 20th century. I, I, do, I do think that in a, in, a, in a completely unstudied way, you know. Absolutely, I, I so agree with that. And I was, I was um, going to bring this up. Um, I think that one of the reasons why she never get or so rarely gets her due on that score is that you know um, so many people their their primary kind of mode of uh, consuming Christie is through adaptations, right? Mm -hmm. Even if they've read some of the novels, sometimes they've only watched the televised adaptations or movies or or what have you, or that's what they remember, that's what maybe they watch multiple times, and that's what kind of seeps in as what Christie is. But when you read the books closely, as we're doing, in order, it couldn't be more true that the settings change. The post-war novels feel so different from the novels set in the 30s, but that tend to more have that kind of sparkling uh, essence to them and, you know, uh, no problem, you know, no sort of problematic relationship with servants. Once we get into the post-war uh, post World War II, it's completely different, and then it, I think you know things change even more as we get into the '60s as well. She's by no means ignoring that, but what the prevailing adaptations do, you know, we've got our Suchet series that made the perfectly defensible position from a production standpoint to set basically every single novel and short story in 1936 or thereabout, and then we also have the Joan Hickson Miss Marple series, and even the, the, the latter day ITV uh, adaptations with Julia McKenzie and Geraldine McEwen, they're all basically set in a vague mid fifties milieu. So none of that nuance when it comes to setting and time has been preserved from text to screen. And I think people just don't realize it because they're, they're, they're watching those things and it just doesn't come through. And I think that that's, goes to the heart of why we tend not to give her the, the credit on that score. Would you agree with that? Uh, me, or, yes, God, yes, yes. I think that puts it very well. And actually referring back to Sarah Phelps, who did something interesting by m m picking novels from, um, it went from, and then there were none, didn't it? And, and Ordeal by Innocence and, and then The Pale Horse. There's another one I can't remember. Oh, Witness for the Prosecution. So 
picking a time in history um, up to the pale horse, which is very 60s. Um, but in a way, I'm not saying they're not, that's not clever, but in a way that's not quite the point. It has to seep through. It has to be um, uh, inferred rather than, I think if you lay it out too plainly, again, that's not Agatha. It's something else. It's just something else. Um, they're very elastic. They're almost like Shakespeare. You can do Hamlet in, a, in an asylum and you could get away with it probably. I mean, it would be wrong, but you could do it or you could do it in the future or you could do it in the 17th century if you want to be really right. Or but some you, university troupe has done every single version of that in some black box theater. So, <laughs> oh, right, yes. Hamlet underwater, Hamlet, whatever. Yes, exactly. You know, what, skating, what the hell. But you can do that with her. You, they are elastic. You can, the plots ping back. You pull, 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 and they will ping back because they're always based on something fundamentally true. They're not, as I say, you know, they're not realistic. They're never untrue. So you can, they will ping back to that fundamental truth at the heart of them. But are they infinitely elastic? I would say they're not. I would say they have, yes, they're, 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 they're to, to bring out what's brilliant about them, I think you, you, you require nuance and you require a kind of sophistication, the things we've been talking about, in order to make them the best they can be, in my view. Um, I can also see if you want to adapt them, it's a bit boring just to do exactly what she did. It's more fun to, you know, do something with it. Um, and at least it's keeping her up and about. And, and as I say, these modern adaptations they do take her seriously, which I think is the key thing. Although Murder on the Orient Express, the original one, I think is probably the best one of all because that really took the important thing at the heart of that book. You always felt that. You always felt the, the need for justice. The, 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 I'm trying not to give too much away, but the, 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 the thing that underpins that plot, you're always very aware of in that film, I think. Um, I think so that's, that's, yeah, sorry, Kemper, go on. No, sorry to interrupt. I, um, I think it's the rare film and, and I, I don't think this will spoil anything, but it's the rare film that is, um, the, the best and most crucial parts of the film are its flashbacks because the yes. flashbacks are to what is underpinning everything and they're done, um, very effectively, you know, there's a, there's a different, uh, uh, look and feel to them and and it just kind of undergirds the you know the more light and and sparkling story underneath I mean I think it's as you were talking about you know um, just sort of the fact that Christie is a subtle writer right it's that the the subtlety and the nuance in what she's doing where she's kind of presenting you with something and if you wish you can think about it more deeply and probe underneath and you know, uh, get insight into what it was like to be in post-World War England. And, you know, these kind of serious, weighty, socio-political issues, but she's never forcing you to deal with them in, in the best novels. I mean, I would argue that some of the more thrillery novels, she actually does try to force you to deal with them, such as Destination <laughs> Unknown, which we're not as, as huge uh, uh, fans of, but I do think that, um, that the the subtlety and the kind of nuance and the complexity to what she's presenting and then allowing her readers to either delve into or not like that's what she does so consistently and and that's what you know for example the Phelps adaptations aren't so much doing because they're forcing the issue right and Christie never forces the issue and really at times I suppose to her detriment because then you get people like those two mystery writers you were you know doing an interview with who clearly didn't read her very deeply right I mean that's the thing Christy actually uh, a deep reading will will get you so much more and not all authors are like that so you but but you have to do the work in a way as the reader yes I, I do think that but I I sometimes think that the most successful artists of whatever kind operate on two levels. So you can just enjoy. And I mean, my mother, who is a big Christie fan, um, she would just say, well, I read them. I know who did it. I don't want to read them again. They're brilliant for what they are. Um, I obviously don't take that view, but both views are valid. 
and that is you know it's like you either you think hey jude's a really nice tune or you think it's a kind of you know i mean it's 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 popular culture at its best will work on those two levels um but i i mean the one have you done hickory dickory dock or have you come to hickory dickory dock <laughs> we just did it just well did it. that's hellishly good about a time isn't it i mean that's when i read that again i thought oh my god this is you know multicultural london in in you know and i suppose some of the things she said might not pass muster today because you know the language of the 50s is different <laughs> nevertheless it's a very very interesting snapshot of of a changing you know the student hostel the, the everyone from different parts of the world and all that sort of thing i think it's a really and and drugs and all that i think it's a really interesting book really interesting one yeah. we have some did you not <laughs> did you not like it <laughs> Um, we, I think that, you know, we, we also, we have a, uh, when we're kind of ranking the novels and doing yeah. our analysis, we have set categories that we use to compare each novel. And one of our final category, because we didn't want to ignore this facet of reading Christie, um, as, you know, from a 21st century perspective, but our final category yeah. refers to stuck in its time elements. Because yeah, yeah. often when reading Christie, you have those moments where where you're reading along and then you go, oh, you know, there th this is this is presented either just from word choice or you know how how she's choosing to to characterize, etc., um, in a way that jars. And yeah, that yeah. book um, had the highest stuck in its time, and we deduct essentially points from a book for stuck in its time ness. And I'll just say without getting from further into it, that book had the highest uh, point deductions in, in that category. That's uh, very interesting. And I completely see where you're coming from. I totally see that. I can imagine reading it. But if you, if you allow, if you cut her a bit of slack for inappropriate language, et cetera, et cetera, I sort of took the view on, I took a, 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 a more a kindly view of it, that it was actually because the person who has, there's a line in it when um, somebody says, oh, he's the only one of us that's got any um, racial feeling. And he is utterly condemned for being that person. That in other words, it is meant to be, um, uh, uh, it, it is meant to be a kind of multi, multi, pre presentation of multiculturalism in a way that is um, uh, pro, because I mean, she obviously was uh, an immensely cosmopolitan woman who traveled the world and lived many, many, months of her life in the in the near east so um that's uh kind of yeah i can see that there's a debate to be had about that one totally i think that they're <laughs> often you know she is she is she is often or perhaps always well-intentioned and i think that yes, there are, that's the point yes yeah that's there the are i i think our our take on that book is that that was one where her her intentions were were not enough um i think she <laughs> You didn't get there, um, but uh, but yes, I think it's and it's important to keep those those uh, good intentions in mind. I think um, when reading and and approaching those issues, just as a as a general matter. But I yeah, think, I think I think that. Yes, yeah, sorry, Catherine. Oh, no, but like look at something like Taken at the Flood too, like which I think is like an incredibly good example of the post-war era in England, right? I mean, like without sort of hammering it over the head, every single character is impacted by, you know, how, like, the end of the war and what happened during it and sort of taxes and farming and, you know, all of those details, which I mean, you could gloss over if you were reading it just for the plot, but I mean, they're integral, you know, to the book. So, I mean, I think that there are a lot of examples like that. Yeah, that's a really good example. It's a really good book, isn't it? Yeah, the, the, the sense of dislocation, the guy who didn't go to fight, all that kind of thing, and how bad he feels about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's a the degree of political incorrectness in that book as well, I have to say. But it's um, you know, that's a slippery slope, isn't it? Going down that. Yeah. No. I and I just wanted to um. Um, I wanted to quote one of the the authors who you quote in your book, and we because we've referenced her, P.D. James, and I actually made note 
of, of this quote that you have in your book, which is that um, she's, she's speaking of Christy and she says, she has the ability to conjure a world without actually describing it. And I so appreciated that you included that quote from P.D. James, who we could not love more. We are both just enormous P.D. James fans. And, um, you know, I think so often if, if people are going to quote P.D. James about Christy, they, they give that other quote where she talks about cardboard characters. <laughs> she did say that at one point, but she obviously did have a great deal of, of respect for Christy. Um, and I just, I, I love that quote. And I think it's, um, as we've been saying, just a, just an, an aspect of her novels that don't necessarily get their due. And then the other, the other novel I just wanted to highlight because I think it also goes to the heart of this, um, this just this brilliant point that you made uh, in, in your book um, about you know, the fact that the, perhaps the best Christie puzzle mysteries are the ones in which solving character solves the puzzle, right? Once you understand the dynamics between the characters, you know who done it. And not all of them function that way, but in, in perhaps the best ones, such as Five Little Pigs and The Hollow, they, they absolutely do. And um, I just, I, I just want to highlight that because I think it's such an interesting way to think about Christy, and, um, and you present it beautifully in your book, and I think it, it just goes a long way toward thinking about her in a slightly different way as this literary author. Um, and the one book for me where, um, which is such a shining example, is Evil Under the Sun. Mm -hmm. as well where it's you know once we understand who those people are once we realize that we've been thinking about Arlena Marshall the wrong way we get it and it's so powerful and it's and so moving, powerful. almost it's powerful and it's moving and it really does show that you know character is what she does well and it's you know there's so many people that would hear me say that and say you're wrong like that's what she does horribly because there is this misconception and you know, my answer is, is swiftly becoming read Five Little Pigs, read The Hollow, read Evil Under the Sun, because, you know, I, there still is a bias perhaps towards some of the other books where that solving of character at, is not at the core of what she's doing. It's not so much in And Then There Were None or Murder on the Orient Express. There are always aspects of it, though, right? There like, are. yeah. I, I hear you because the plot is so conceptual and dazzling. Yeah, um, but character in And Then There Were None, I think is, um, Pretty you important. Know, <laughs> well, I, I, I don't want to give too much away, but it's, um, gosh, when it gets down to the end, a character like Vera, what she's, I think, again, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous of sounding um, a bit lunatical, like I'm sort of making out she's Dostoevsky or something, which she patently is not. Right. But what we were talking about earlier about distilling and um, simplicity um, it, it, for which you can condemn her or you can think, hang on, this is simplicity of the most beautifully deceptive kind. And if you turned the geometry the other way around, as I say in the book, my book, um, Turn the geometry another way around and you've got a hell of a lot of stuff there and a hell of a lot of profundity and truth about human nature. Um, but the geometry is so perfect, sometimes more than others, I, as, as we're saying, but, you know, um, the geometry is perfect in Five Little Pigs, but there's also this wealth of material. Um, that's why I think it's a most successful book. But I, I'm a bit amazed, really, that people... I mean, everyone's entitled to their opinion, but that people still think she does character badly. I am a bit, I mean, some of them have been chucked in. Obviously you can see that, you know, there's a pompous colonel or there's a, you know, some of them you can write off. But you take a character like Mrs. Dane Calthrop, you know, the vicar's wife, mm -hmm. I think she's incredible. I think she's incredible. And all she does is breeze in, say something and breeze off again. I know that woman. Right. Especially right. being English and growing up in a village. You know, there's, there's quite, a, Miss Marple is very, you know, it's almost like, um, of course, they're different now, villages, but it's, it's, it's quite on the money, really. Yeah. 
No, I, I agree with that 100%. I think also, you know, she's often, she uses, she does do character tropes. We talk about that all the time on the podcast. You know, you, we all know what they are. There's the female companion. There's the Anglo-Indian colonel. There's the, my favorite, which is one that I didn't recognize until doing the podcast, but there's so many of them. And we just had one in Hickory Dickory Dock is the, the sort of blustery, crabby seeming young male communist slash socialist who actually has <laughs> a heart of gold. She has so many of them and it's such a patronizing view because it's sort of like, oh, you and your, you know, your, your idealistic ways, you'll learn in like 20 years, um, you know, and grow up. But like she, but, but it's not a, it's not a contemptuous view. She really does have a lot of affection, I think, for, you know, that, that youthful kind of idealism. Um, but then what she often does is, you know, and I won't say which book it happens in, but it's so brilliant. You know, in one of her books, that stock character of the Anglo-Indian colonel who's such a bore turns out to be the murderer. Yeah. And so it's like she's playing on the fact that don't underestimate any of these people. These are all real people who are, you know, often hiding behind the mask of something that seems cardboard and, yeah. and not necessarily interesting, but these are all people and people will surprise you. It's just that she's not herself directly accessing the interiority of those characters in the way that I think we've been taught is what a robust novelist does, right? They get at what are their thoughts and feelings. And for her, again, it's you sometimes have to do that. You have to make those connections yourself, but she's giving you the tools. You know, I think I. I mean, I know you. I mean, I remember when I was talking about it to P.D. James. She said um, she was quite lovely, and like you, I'm a huge fan. She was wonderful, and actually, a lot of respect for Agatha came across in our conversation. Right. You know, and she actually helped me. She didn't say a lot, but she helped me enormously. Um, but she did say, "There's no point in you going to talk to Ruth." <laughs> That's Ruth Rendell. She said, Ruth just hates her. Ruth just hates her. Um, because, of course, Ruth um, takes the psychological view. But I think I say in the book, and if I don't, I should have done, but I think I do, that um, Towards Zero would have made a really good Ruth Rendell. You know, it would have been a, the, 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 the psychopathy would have been mm -hmm. excavated and all this kind of thing. But it does seem to me, I don't mean to be rude, it does seem to me a little bit fifth former to think that character can only be shown through, oh, you know, every detail has got to be sort of, I, I would have thought in a kind of postmodern <laughs> um, literary universe that the way she describes character is, is, is equally valid. I, you know, I'm, I don't know. I, the, 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 the Ruth Rendell, the famous awful television program about Agatha that really upset her daughter, her daughter, where they said she'd murdered the, the, the genre because her, her characters were so thin, they were just puppets, she just wrote algebra, this kind of thing. And it was really, really vicious. And it, it really did distress Rosalind. But I thought that had kind of gone out the window now. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, even with the adaptations are kind of making people think, oh, there's more here than we thought. You know, this isn't just colonels and maids and all that kind of thing. I don't, I, but I don't know, really. I don't know where, the, where people stand on her now, really. I mean, I do think it's interesting. We've heard from some booksellers, um, and I've also noticed if you go to the um, sort of online, um, library app that we have um yeah. they're sold out of christie during the lockdown that's apparently yeah. the first oh, thing that, <laughs> one of the first things that's gone people have been having to back order um christie's and they're back ordered on the public library website um for the ebooks so i mean clearly it's clearly right now at least people yeah. are going there you know that's what they're looking for. So, and I do think there's been a new appreciation and whether or not it's the new adaptations or if it's the, you know, new focus on the movies or, you know, et cetera. So I, I do hope that more people approach the books sort of with a greater degree of respect, maybe. Yeah. 
yeah but i mean you guys are young i mean it's it's not it's 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 i mean it, does that imply there is a kind of new generation coming through of um you know people who i mean in this country she's become quite cool you know she really has she there, there's a um a player version of witness for the prosecution that until the lockdown i mean it was it was like a hot ticket in london you know for young smart people to go and see this witness for the prosecution it was she has become pretty fashionable but i'm, I'm intrigued to know uh, in america what the what the situation is i feel less so i don't know what you think kemper i feel still a little bit stodgy like here don't you think i think yeah i mean i think that though i, I I have to hope, and, and this is probably my own bias because we've dedicated four years worth of a podcast to this, but I think that um, people are getting more comfortable with the notion of appreciating something on two different levels. Like, and that is such a postmodern thing to do, right? I mean, I think that um, every, I think almost everyone can appreciate Christy on that surface level of, of sheer joy and entertainment, right? This is a fascinating page turnover read. I want to figure out who done it. Okay, I just did. The book's over. Like, and, and for many people, that's enough. And sometimes for me, that's enough, you know? But then this idea that, well, you can take something like that that seems light and slight and think more deeply about it and get so much more out of it. And the fact that it's, it's requiring you to do that is actually part of its power. You know, I think that obviously that, that idea, like the, the notion of duality existed in 1950. I'm not saying it didn't, but I think that perhaps it's been popularized um, in a way that it hadn't been even 20 years ago. Um, and I think you get a little bit of that when it comes to Christie, that people are willing to look at it both ways. And yeah. I mean, in the, from, from, I was amazed when, her, when she married her second husband, Max, um, who was obviously an intellectual, you know, his archaeology and all that. And his clever friends um, really thought the world of her. They really, and um, uh, like T.S. Eliot thought the world of her and Clement Attlee thought the world of her and P.G. Woodhouse sort of, he, he, he said, oh, I read you for your characters. <laughs> um, then she went out, this is here, of course. So, I mean, it's, it, I can't speak for America, obviously, but here. Then she went out of fashion. Um, but remained very popular but what we were saying about the guilty pleasure and now she's on a she's on and up again but um the the to me they have a i don't even know for they have a kind of hypnotic i say they're like fairy tales for adults to me they have a almost hypnotic um the the the, the pleasure of it's almost like a physical sensation the resolution because it's so beautiful and and you know you know obviously the books vary in quality but in the best books when that resolution i can feel it coming like act five of the play and i do i find it exciting to read because it's so she so knows what she's doing <laughs> and it's so um it does remind me of being a kid and rereading a fairy tale and knowing what's going to happen, but still getting a huge pleasure out of the words, feeling it happen. Um, now, I don't know if that's an unusual way of looking at her, but the, the fairy tales for adults sort of, that's how they've always, they've always had a kind of spell over me, which is a little bit more than just reading them as novels. Uh, and it must be to do with the arc of the plot and the total control she has over it. Um, and the, the, the totally directional quality of her writing, that there's not a word wasted and she's just following it through in this completely, um, yeah, controlled, almost impersonal way. Um, and it does, it sort of mesmerizes me. Now, this may just be me, who knows? <laughs> but I, I can reread them, you know, if I'm unhappy or anything like that. Oh, I'll read. The Moving Finger, which I think is almost her most perfect book. Um, and it, it just, yeah, it has a, an almost physical effect of pleasure. Um, yeah. I, 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 it does work that way for me as well. And I think, um, and, and you're, you're kind of getting at another, I think, key point that I took from, from your book, which is, um, I think sometimes we, um, what people do wrong in, in, in kind of 
um, analyzing Christy is to use, um, you know, or, or to measure it, measure its kind of verisimilitude, right? Like it's how it compares to reality. And if you do think of it as a fairy tale, or I would even say, I think it was Robert Barnard who made this point, that there's something almost mythic about the way she writes as if she's creating mythology. It's elemental. It's kind yes. of, she's yes. writing in this foundational way. And that's, and sometimes that's where, you know, yes, you have tropes because what's more trope-like than the characters that appear in myths and, you know, this person's angry and this person is, you know, lustful and blah, blah, blah. Um, but when we read fairy tales, when we read myths, we don't say, hmm, this doesn't seem like, you know, it would actually happen in real life. So this, let's just toss this away, right? But because there's an underlying truth to the characters and the, in, you know, the interpersonal dynamics, and we can kind of glean from that truths, you know, those truths we can then apply to our lives. And I, and I, you make this point, I mean, I'm just cribbing from, from you here, but you know, that is I think, in a sense, what's happening when we read Christie, because even though, yes, these plots are ridiculous, of course they would never happen. And we struggle with this when we're doing our rankings, because we, one of them is called plot credibility, where it's like, could this happen in real life? And so often it's like, well, of course it couldn't, that's insane. But it doesn't matter because a you're kind of buying into you know the suspension of disbelief when you're when you're reading one of these mysteries. But the even if the plot itself, the sequence of events would not have happened, the way that the people are interacting with each other, the motivations for the murder, the reactions to what happened, and the underlying interpersonal dynamics are one hundred percent true. Well, and that's the entire point of Miss Marple, right? That Miss Marple yeah. solves every single case by finding an analog in the history of the village. So essentially, yes, this is a ludicrous murder that's happened, but also Mrs. So-and-so went to the grocers and, you know, a very similar thing happened, except, you know, it had to do with an argument over the fish. Right, because she exactly. was greedy and people are greedy and this is how, what happens when greed, you know, this elemental thing, like this is what greed does to a person. And you sit and you sit there reading the book and you're like, yes, there's truth to that because I've felt greed and I've been affected by greed in my life. And the way that she is, you know, portraying it is true, right? Yeah. yeah. So she's using tropes to, to she's, it, it's like she'll use cliche to actually say something more like what you're saying about even under the sun with Arlena the cliche of Arlena and then oh hang on a minute not so mm -hmm. that inversion of Arlena I'm so glad you I think that's just beautiful yeah. the simplicity is there is something really beautiful about the simplicity the, the I don't know it's almost like watching sport or something there is that, that, that's not a very good analogy but it there is there is something about the simplicity of her language and the exactitude of her language, almost always, not 100%, but, you know, um, that, again, I find, I suppose, as a writer, find really, it's so simple that it's really mysterious. <laughs> you know, how yeah. have you done yeah. that? How have you done all that with those words? And that really foxes me and it really fascinates me. Um, it is because a little say, Someone else would take. Sorry, Catherine, go. Oh no, I I think that you you cut yourself off with the the sport analogy, but it is a little bit like watching like an incredibly good tennis match, right? Yeah. Nothing is changing. Everybody has a racket and a ball and the court. That's all that there is, right? But when you see somebody be, you know, you know Serena Williams, they have that ball and that tennis racket, and it literally changes how you look at something it somehow like meshes into perfect simplicity you know even though the actual mechanisms behind it are so complicated brilliant you said <laughs> thank you for doing that for me because that came into my head and i thought no i can't follow this through but you have so thank you <laughs> no, you're much. totally right laura so <laughs> no but it, i'm just sort of talking to you guys, which is, I'm really, really enjoying. And I'm sort of trying to, although I've written this really long book about her, you do, you know, sometimes I come up against, why do you love this woman so much? Because you also love, you know, Muriel Spark and D.H. Lawrence and Thomas Hardy and Flaubert and all these people who are obviously better, you know, but it's not, books don't quite work like that. And, but it, it, it gives me the pleasure that 
I had as a kid reading, you know, Grimm's fairy tale or something, what you said about the elemental and mm -hmm. completely right. Uh, I completely agree with you. Um, but to say childlike implies, oh, well, they're what you read. You know, that awful thing when people say, oh, they're what you read for comfort or they're what you read because they're cozy or you sit by the fire and read them. Um, I don't quite get that from them. I find them, I don't find them troubling in the sense that they're really about murder because they're not really about murder, are they? They're, I find them stimulating in a way that I can't think of any other writer or, Pat, or Muriel Spark in a way although she's much more literary. Um, and Agatha really admired Muriel Spark. Again, there's that kind of mysterious simplicity. Um, but obviously they're not genre, so she hasn't... I mean, obviously when you've got a genre to fall back on, as it were, it's a, it's a, it's a safety net, literary-wise. But um, I suppose nobody else writes like her. Nobody else has got that kind of expressionist. I mean, and then there is real expressionist, isn't it? Um, and I suppose because she's not taught and never went to school and never thought, oh, this is how I ought to write. I suppose there's a fascination of someone literally doing instinctively what they are just completely brilliant at. That fascinates me as well, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm curious too, because you make, um you make, I think, quite a bold claim in your book as well. And I, and it's um, it's pretty obvious at this point, I think, which your favorite Christie's are, right? I mean, it seems to be Five Little Pigs, The Hollow, The Moving Finger, I know was another another big favorite of yours. But um, in your book, you do talk a lot about the Mary Westmacott novels, which oh, are yeah. these, you know, um, uh, I think uh, not read by a lot of people and, and a lot of even, you know, serious Christie fans, partially because they're a little hard to come by. They're actually like That's not, you know, they're not as in print as they're not impossible to come by, but they're, they're certainly not as readily available as, as mm -hmm. the, the quote unquote Christie's. Um, but you do deal, deal a lot with them. And it's something that we've tackled a little bit. And, but I was really fascinated by this claim that you made, which is that her best book overall just may be The Rose and the Yew Tree, which is one of her Mary Westmacott titles. And I'm just, I'm curious, you know, what you, what you think of the Mary, first of all, what the Mary Westmacott novels even are, because we should start with the, the, you know, this notion that they're romance novels is kind of nonsense because they're not. So, I mean, what would you even call them? And what do you think, you know, what kind of light do they shed on Christie as a writer? Yeah, that's it. Of course, thank you for bringing those up because I suddenly, they are such a massive, they're a massive part of my biography. And they were massively important when I first met her daughter because I'd read them all and she loved me for that, you know, because I think she thought that means this woman takes her seriously. Mm. And she really took her mother seriously, although they had quite a fraught relationship. But, and, and I mean, my goodness, those Mary Westmacott's are very autobiographical and to be her daughter and read them would not always be an easy thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. What I think they are is, 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 is they shed a, you know, what we've been talking about, they are a very interesting part of the discussion because they are the obverse of the detective fiction. They are um, all the stuff of psychology and, and uh, you know, all the things that I've said you don't need in a novel. She, in, in true mid 20th century, proper novelist, you know, sincere and nothing about style really um certainly nothing about genre just really honestly trying to get grips with the human condition um in a way that is so the opposite of the detective fiction you can't believe it really because there is pure smooth perfect surface here it's like oh wow anything that interests her she will you know, the first one, Giant Spread, it's all about music, music. What is music? What is music? You know, I mean, my God, what a question. And then <laughs> the Unfinished Portrait, which is all about her first marriage, and she doesn't tell us why she disappeared or how she, but it's implicit. You know, that must have been hell to write. All about her mother, her mother dying. My God, she must have been, like, lacerating herself. Um, the Rose and the Yew Tree is about the election in this country after the war you know when Winston Churchill lost the election Attlee won the election and the country changed it was changing anyway but that was the symbol 
she writes all about that, all about that election, all about the death of class, and yet not the death of class, because it won't ever die in this country, I don't think. Um, it's an incredible novel. So the ideas are so interesting, but it's everything that's not tied up neatly. Um, she just lets it splurge out, and of course she could do it because she had a pseudonym. Um, once the pseudonym was exposed, she, she kind of lost interest in them. But I think there are a lot to do with her first marriage. Um, you know, her daughter said to me, I could, I, if I saw my father, I couldn't tell her, couldn't mention his name really. I think that went so deep. Um, we haven't talked about 1926, but my God, you know, she never got over that. And I think the Westmacotts were a way of dealing with that stuff and the nature of love and is it an illusion? And if it's an illusion, why do the feelings hurt so much and blah, blah, blah. And, and just getting it all out of herself. And of course she also wrote poetry, quite lovely, some of it, you know, poignant. She was such a mix. She was such a grown up worldly, controlled woman and such a childlike imaginative woman it's 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 that's what really fascinated me about her so i mean have you read have you read them all or have you you say they're hard to get hold of or what we read some of them we covered unfinished portrait um okay in depth which i mean yeah. it's a painful book to even read it really is yeah. So we, yeah, I can't imagine writing it. I mean, I'm I'm really curious now that you've touched upon it a few times about meeting Rosalind and that first meeting at Greenway. And you know, I mean, obviously that must have been hugely intense. Oh my God, I can see her now coming down her stair lift. I went to the front door at Greenway, which I wasn't supposed to go. I was meant to go around the back. That's not a snob thing. It was just the door wasn't open, and she came down. And oh my God, I did the house. I don't know, have you guys been to the house? No, we, we, we hope to, you know, perhaps next year when flying yeah. internationally is, is, is a reality. If, 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 we're, if we're allowed in other countries again as Americans. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, I really have. I mean, you would, you, it would be, you know, you, I'm sure you'd really love it, the grounds and everything. It's, I mean, it's the most, oh, it's so beautiful walking up there and then, she, I mean, Agatha didn't drink, Rosalind did. She gave me this enormous gin and it sort of <laughs> made me a bit sort of silly in one way, but relaxed in another. And it, and, and it just sort of went from there. And we just started talking about very much the way we're talking now, but which then was a bit more um, left field because a lot of she was having to deal with a lot of people saying her mother was you know had murdered detective fiction i mean come on um that was a you know that was a big television program in this country i mean wicked really but um and and she was like i imagine agatha you know rather grand you know you know um and um a bit awe-inspiring but very warm funny, lovely husband, Anthony, I adored him. And just, I don't know, made me think what must it have been like to grow up the daughter of Agatha Christie, because of course there was a lot of money, but she had to kind of run the show and all that. And it just, I don't know, it, it, but it was with the Westmacotts, which I thought were gold, pure gold. And with this revelatory nature about this woman, and it, it, it just sort of went from there. And by the end, we had lunch and it was all very lovely. Um, but yeah, I was, I was nervous. I was, I was really, really nervous. I had no idea what to expect. But because she loved dogs and I loved dogs and it all got very friendly and lovely by the end. But yeah. Well, I'm sure the pre-lunch gin helped. <laughs> it was <a> gin, <laughs> This clanking drink trolley, I remember. And I mean, Greenway is so beautiful, but it's also very much a family home. And of course, when I got the gig to do the biography, everything had been kept, you know, these generations worth of, it was just so moving. The christening robes from the 19th century and the menu card from her mother's wedding and all this, everything, everything kept and all Archie's love letters and my God, you know, I mean, it's just almost too much. And there is that thing because she was very private. You, I mean, a biographer is, you know, you are, you are an interloper. You really are. There's no doubt about it. Well, but, you're um, a detective. 
Well, yeah, yeah, you are. I mean, and very, and the archaeology analogy is, is right. um, you would never really get to grips with her because she's too intelligent and too complex and too multi-layered. But the relationships, you know, the two marriages, the daughter, the mother, who I think was really almost the person she, yeah, I think the love of her life, really, her mother, uh, the clever sister, the ne'er-do-well brother, you know, it was just, wow, you know, incredible, incredible, but also terrifying because she is a monolith and you're dealing with a monolith. And, um, I, well, you know, um, but, but, but so worth it so worth trying to get to grips with this extraordinary phenomenal admirable you know just her productivity for god's sake how she would write you know absent in the spring another westmacott which she wrote in a week and she had a week off during the war from her work you know absent in the spring is a really interesting novel it's all about lockdown and self-isolation and you know it's um that's quite a good one to read now. <laughs> <laughs> but do you, I mean, did you, did you come down in favor of, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to make great literary claims for them, but, but as a, as a, as the other side of the sort of puzzle of Agatha in a way, they are, they're incredibly interesting. Did you, how did they strike you? They're, they're incredibly personal. And I think it was, it was really illuminating to, um, to read Unfinished Portrait side by side with the autobiography actually, because some passages are almost seemed like they're lifted. And she just literally changes the name from Agatha to Celia. Like there, it's it's just her, you know? Yeah. And he's, she's writing about her own life down to the minute details of things that happened to her, like when she was going abroad with her family, um, and you know, just just all of the the sort of ins and outs and the intricacies of her childhood, which was you know she was so fond, I think, of talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it almost and and obviously, unfinished portrait was written before her autobiography. I mean, she wrote the autobiography over decades, bit by bit, it seems. So I have to imagine she perhaps even used a little bit of that because it was so in, intensely autobiographical. Um, so I mean, I think it. I see why you reference the West Macots as much as you do, because you really are trying to, you know, I think, dig down into who she was as a person and what happened to her. And, and it, I mean, it's striking to me that this started also with a meeting with the family, with Rosalind, because, you know, those we've touched a little bit, you know, glancingly already on the disappearance and all of those kind of issues of 1926 which, you know, you, I think, seem to make the claim really formed her as a writer, like really informed kind of her work ethic and, and, and changed, you know, the obvious, you know, in very obvious ways, but also maybe not some, some such obvious ways changed, you know, her way of life and, and just the sort of what she wanted to get out of it. And um, was all of that kind of part of the deal when you were sort of doing this, that you were going to get extremely personal? Because it's just what she never wanted to do herself, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, they gave me, uh, they were very good. You know, they gave me carte blanche, really. They gave me, uh, the, the, Rosalind died. Um, I met her twice, she died. Uh, then I met her husband again. He was really interesting because he'd met Archie and Archie's second wife. And, you know, my God, what a thing to live with. They were all living with this for, you know, those 11, people say 11 days, well, it was another 50 years for Agatha and it wasn't great for Rosalind either and Archie what must it be like every time you turn on the radio there's my ex-wife you know it's um just the, the ramifications of that and I did feel that was I mean it's such an obvious thing to say but it's you know what a thing to do to be able to do that because I reenacted that disappearance. I went to Newlands Corner on December the 3rd, what would it have been, 2005, I think, and then did the whole train thing and all that. Um, but you couldn't take the same trains because they'd mostly closed. But I, I, that to me, to stand there under that completely starless sky was, was, a, was kind of amazing, really. And I probably went a bit, you know, trying to get under her skin, but I, it did convince me that this was a very, very real trauma because it was scary. It was really scary. 
um, and she went through a night there and, and, and I also, but what I also thought was like the guy who gave me the idea for Agatha Christie and when I split up with him and I really hated him and I might have said, oh, I'm going to disappear and make you feel really bad. But to do it, to do it, to go through with it, that's one hell of a thing. You know, I just felt you had to get to the bottom of that in so far as it was possible to, to understand this woman in so far as it was possible. And I mean, Rosalind was kind of elliptical about it and sort of said, yeah, I mean, it was obviously that she was trying to get Archie back, thinking like Agatha, plotting, but not really in her right mind, thinking that a private tragedy wouldn't become a kind of public sensation. Um, but the, I knew it couldn't have been a hoax or something like that. You just couldn't have done what she did physically for those petty reasons. It's just not possible. Um, that was what I felt anyway, and what I was told by Rosalind. And, and I was given, yeah, I was given total access and kind of allowed to write what I wanted, which was incredible. I mean, all the letters that um, Max and Agatha had written to each other during the war, they were really fascinating. No one had seen those before. Really interesting. The second marriage is really interesting, I think. Um, so Matthew Pritchard, I mean, he was, he was brilliant. You know, he did let me, but I suppose they knew I was on her side. You know, they knew that I thought she was the business and was going to write about her as a writer with the utmost respect and admiration. Um, so I suppose that was the key thing maybe. Yeah. Well, no, that, that comes through. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, you can, you can do both things, I suppose. You know, I think that the, the, the danger with Christy is to focus too much on that period of time to the exclusion yeah. of taking her seriously as a writer. But what I love what you do is that you frame it within the greater investigation into what made this writer tick, right? Like how was she able to do what she did and do it as well as she did? And, and, you know, obviously a biographer is going to investigate life experiences and, and, you know, try to figure out how they contributed to that. And I think, um, um, you just do an excellent job of it. And, and all also, you know, like you, you kept on caveating, as you were saying, getting to the bottom of this as much as we can, understanding yes. this mysterious woman as much as we can. I mean, your book, by the way, which, you know, we should, we should mention the title at some point, but Agatha Christie, A Mysterious Life, you know, it's there in, this, in the subtitle. She's, she's a mystery that's never going to quite be solved as, no. as a person. <laughs> that's absolutely right. And it would be a presumptuous and be ridiculous to think. and that's what i think frustrates people about the disappearance you can't put poro on it you can't there is no the, the comfort of omniscience with the detective fiction genre is is quite obviously um you know not available to us with this disappearance so you come as close as you can um there are facts that are known there are uh, thousands of newspaper articles from the time which are very very interesting because my god it was a tabloid frenzy and when she was found it was even worse because you know they were no longer sorry for her they hated her you know the woman the you know a woman getting it in the neck as is not unusual and um i think the the, the effect it had on her writing i mean that is I don't know, but there's no doubt about it that she went from being what she thought of as a gifted amateur who would go from the man in the brown suit to Secret of Chimneys to, oh, suddenly there's the murder of Roger Ackroyd, oh my goodness, to being a, 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 a writer. And I don't think there's any way she would have written as Mary Westmacott if she'd stayed with Archie. And the, of course, the really imponderable is what would she have done if she'd stayed with Archie, you know? Um, would she have, because she, she remade her life, no doubt about it, she, she built it back um, and, and became incredibly, you know, almost Balzacian in her productivity and <laughs> created an alter ego and blah, 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 and would write three books in a year. I, I, I don't think that could possibly have happened if she'd stayed with him. Really, I don't. I think... Um, he was, he was, he was, um, he sort of directed the course of her life in, in every way, really. 
um, I suppose one could say. Yeah, well, it's, it's fascinating to ponder that, that alternate yeah. reality, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, because of course her second husband had enough sense to um, let her go on, get on with it, <laughs> which yeah. was very, very wise and that worked very well, you know. Um, one of the um, one of the many fun facts you also include in your book um, is is this one, which is that of her fifty five full length detective novels, Murder for Financial Gain is at the center of thirty six, which is just shy of two thirds. I mean that is a lot, but it's really not hard to believe because as we're going through these, I mean money is so often the motive. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, how how true, right? Like, I mean, how how true to life. Um, and we've made this comparison before, which is another one that I'm sure some people would, you know, um, uh, not not think is an apt one. But Jane Austen. I mean, Jane Austen. It's sort of you know just that that cynicism at the core of Austen. You know, you can kind of feel that uh, when it comes to money makes the world go round. Also, uh, is is kind of humming underneath a lot of Christie. Um, so absolutely. I'm asking you this actually as a um, <laughs> as it as a uh, lead up to a question though, which you may not want to get into, um, or maybe you do, but it's something that I think is is kind of um, dogging us right now, which is Christie's tax problems. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> once you start looking for it, taxes are mentioned in almost every book. I mean, she's and she had such massive tax issues, which you do go into in your book, but I'm just wondering if it's possible to, in as simple and lay, you know, layman's terms as possible, explain what the issue was with her taxes, because it's a little hard to, I think, kind of wrap one's, one's head around. It, yeah, it really is. And it went on for um, kind of 30 years. It began in America, in fact, that it was... I, w I will try and make it really, really simple. I mean, I'm pretty thick about tax myself. How I wrote that bit, I have no idea because I was kind of, oh, please, you know. Um, but anyway, it was it was to do with, there was a test case in America about um, whether authors could keep certain income on their sales or something. And then what happened was that when the war broke out and she needed a lot of money here, to pay because obviously tax went up like mad to pay for the war, but her money was still being impounded in America while this test case was uh, being, you know, examined as it were. So she couldn't pay the tax here. And she also was, you know, interest was creeping up and all that kind of thing. And it sort of got her into a hole that she never really got out of um, through absolutely no fault of her own. You know, she was obviously completely, you know, the sort of woman who paid her taxes. Um, she didn't have a clever accountant or anything like that. She Everything was very much done by the board. Um, but she got in the middle of this kind of crossfire between America and the United Kingdom, whereby one party would be holding on to her money that the other party needed to pay this. And it just escalated to the point where she was... Um, I think it was 1948 and 1963 or four, she was advised to go bankrupt just to get herself out of it. And at this point, she's like almost the biggest selling author in the world. And she's being advised <laughs> to go bankrupt. I mean, it's quite sick, really. Um, you know, obviously, obviously someone who earns as much as she does is going to pay tax. But to, to kind of do that, I thought was, it really made me quite angry, actually. Um, and by the end, it was only sold. Well, first of all, they tried to pay a tax bill by selling off to MGM. And that's when you got those Margaret Rutherford films. Mm -hmm. She really wanted. That was just to pay a tax bill, but it didn't work. And then, it, and then they formed Agatha Christie Limited and she became like a paid a wage, but the tax people were onto that. That didn't really work. They tried to make Greenway and Margaret Garden. That didn't really work. So the only thing that worked was in 1968 when they sold out to Booker McConnell and that got her out of the problem. But of course, by then she was 78 and it had dogged the greater part of her life while she was incredibly productive with this incredible work ethic. And then you would get these letters from Rosalind, you know, I'm very worried about my mother. My mother puts a good face on it, but she is out of her mind about this thing. 
And it, it really was quite awful. It was kind of ill luck, you know. But once you're in that hole, I don't know that you can ever quite dig yourself out of it. Maybe you can today, but I'd, or maybe if you'd had a really whiz accountant or something, but she wasn't like that. Nobody ever really expected her to get that successful. I think that's the point. Her agent, who was a gentleman, and just thought, oh, lovely Agatha, you know. I, I, he, the whole Agatha Christie phenomenon kind of took him like a tidal wave. I don't think he could quite believe it. He was dealing with this, you know, one of the most famous women in the world in the 1950s and onwards. And it, it, it that they were, I suppose now it would all be handled so differently. It would be handled so differently. And now the estate run things, you know, very brilliantly and have made a brilliant brand out of her. But then it was a kind of amateurishness about the English literary, <laughs> you know, it was all just gentlemen going for lovely lunches and things. I think they were all so out of their depth. Um, and she was in the middle of it all. Well, I mean, I suppose, that, I suppose that was the case with a lot of people, though. You look at how many... Um, novelists both both american and english who ended up writing pulp crap for hollywood like in the 30s and 40s um because they needed a paycheck and so you know you know sure go write some lassie movies you know for you know with a pseudonym or whatever i mean that happened so yeah well for the scott fitzgerald went to hollywood didn't he and i i don't know whether that was for those reasons but um but, but yes, of course, absolutely. But I mean, she was massively successful in what she was doing. They right. were selling massively. And yet she worked, she, you know, some of her letters to her agent, like you say, I've earned 30,000 pounds, which I suppose then was like, God knows, you know, about five million or whatever. Where is it? Because <laughs> it had all just gone straight to the revenue. Um, awful, really. I think if you work hard you're entitled to so on a very grand scale she was living hand to mouth she was um going to the near east which i think was where she cut off and escaped you know she couldn't have any stupid letters or people saying will you appear on the television and all this kind of thing she was just, and she could do right and all that and greenway was also an escape but the rest of her life was you know, um, and, and of course, Rosalind had to deal with a lot of it, and Rosalind's husband had to deal with a lot of it, but of course, they also got to live at Greenway as a quid pro quo. So it was, yeah, I'm just thinking about it now how she went from being this gifted lady amateur in the 1920s to this phenomenon, how none of them really ever quite got on top of it. You know, I'm just, that's really just striking me now, actually. And she did, she led a very grand life. But it was all hand to mouth, other than in the 30s, which she said my plutocrat plutocratic period, where she owned, I don't know, I think she owned about six or seven houses or something. And she just had loads and loads of money. Very generous. Um, and then it, uh, it and then it she maintained that grand mindset, but always with the sands shifting beneath her, as it were. So I think the way she carried on working, pretty admirable, really. I I'd, I'd, I admired her so much because I mean, just to write one book is hell, and you know, writers are very precious about things. Oh, I need my proper desk, or I need this, or I need that. And she would just sit there, and you know, she um, in some way, it must have come easily to her. And yet her notebooks show that the plots didn't necessarily come easily to her. But in some way, there wasn't a stopping place between her and her writing. She didn't, she, 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 um, I don't know how to, that's probably not expressing it very well. But with most writers, it's kind of, oh, I've got to get through this barrier in order to get to my writing self. She seems to have accessed that with ease somehow. Um, and, and, and yet always spoke about, the desire for leisure, and yet during the war, when she was working as a dispenser, and there's bombs falling over, she gets a week off and she writes a, a, a Westmacott. So she is. I suppose it's that's the most difficult thing about her, really, is that what she really is is a writer. What she really is is someone who lives in here, and and you, you, that 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 does make people 
ultra mysterious. Um, but things seep out, like what you said about taxes. There's so much about <laughs> there's so much about money. There's so much about yeah. That's 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 the um, and I think most murders probably are done for gain, aren't they? I would suspect they are. I've, no, I've, I, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, you know, she doesn't, there are a couple that are done for love, aren't there, rather than, you know, too much love. There are a couple that are done for that, but generally it's good old gain. Um, and I, I would think that's about, that's about the size of it. And to do with her view of thinking the worst of human nature and hoping for the best, because the worst of human nature is when money comes in, people behave very oddly, as we know. As we definitely know. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, no, well, thank you. I appreciate the um, just sort of shedding a light, I think, on that, the, the, the tax issue, which is something that I think you, other than the, the sort of incidental, but consistently, you know, consistent references to taxes in those novels, especially in the 50s and 60s, you wouldn't really get a sense of that because she was, you know, so sort of not putting things on the surface of her novels, right? But it's just fascinating to know that that was roiling underneath the surface. It really is outrageous that that happened. I mean, it's almost like a, you know, you could you could write like an Edith Wharton-esque novel about it, kind of like the the idea of like the, po like, I'm thinking of like Lily Bart, right? That, you know, the, the poverty lying underneath what looks not like poverty, but is in fact like an extreme, an, you know, an, an oddly impoverished state. It's just, it, it's really interesting that that. That's such an interesting, that's really, God, I love that novel so much. Um, that's, uh, that's, kind, yeah, that's, that's really brilliant. I mean, there's, there are these aspects of her life that aren't so well known, like the fact that she was, you know, on the verge of bankruptcy. I mean, come on, you know, I was so shocked by that. That are, yes, they do have this whole, there's a whole dimensionality about her life that is, my God. You know, it's like I say, her books cover the century, but my God, so did she. And she, she, you know, she had a, her life is an interesting emotional landscape and her, she you know she traveled she did she she lived a life it's it's interesting because women have it easier in many ways now but she had a freedom that i don't think you could have today you know she kind of made she seemed to make up her life in a way that i think would be very difficult to give out um particularly after 1926 when the convention the, the the conventions that she'd expected to have had more or less been ripped away from her she kind of liked the way she wrote she wrote as she wrote she didn't take notice of what anyone else thought or said or this she just instinctively wrote the way she wrote and she kind of lived like that as well i feel um yes she was trammeled by class in a way but i mean when after um, the disappearance, she went to Baghdad on her own, on the Orient Express. Hell of a thing. And her sister, who was not conventional, but she was very shocked by that. You know, she kind of instinctively knew that by doing that, I think it would help to heal um, the, the, the Archie thing, that, that travel and seeking a new, and she writes about that very beautifully in her autobiography, I think, when she travels into the into the east how she it, almost a religious experience for her i think it's like, um, a new like a sorry i lost you like a new beginning for yes, her. yes exactly yeah. exactly um it, so she did she, she i did i did feel that about her that her life she owned her life in a way that's not always easy to do um and not entirely to do with money uh, although that helps um and it, it's it, you know it's um i don't know if that's possible to do now and she she was she's always quite i'm afraid quite scathing about feminists yet yeah, she seemed to me the living embodiment of a woman who ran her own life controlled her own life you know um i suppose convention died hard with her and she was whatever, like we're talking about with Hickory Dickory Dog, she is a creature of her time, her class. There's only so much you can do about that. But, um, she, you know, she, she, she did plenty, really. 
Yeah. Well, one, one, one last question. Cause then I, I feel like we've, <laughs> we've, we've been uh, putting you up here on the, uh, in the, in the hot seat for a while, but, but, uh, we, we appreciate everything. We could be here personally for like five hours. So. Oh no, listen, I have loved this. This has been okay. so great. Anyway, go on. But, um, the, so one of the things that I think has struck us as we've been doing our, our chronological review of Christie is that mm -hmm. I, I think that there is a, a popular conception just because this would be what, what one would imagine, you know, the, the, the way that a writer's career would work, that there is kind of an, an incline in terms of the writing, you know, the quality of her novels in the first half or two thirds of her career, and then a steep decline, right? I think that is something that a lot of people tell themselves about Christy, like, oh, you know, wait till you get to the end, and some of those novels are, are kind of rough. But I don't actually think that that's the case. And I, and I, we haven't, you know, we've only gotten up to Hickory Dickory Dock, so we haven't gotten to a lot of those later novels. But there are a couple of gems that we've yet to get to that are in there, you know, Ordeal by Innocence, The Pale Horse, Endless Night, Nemesis, you know, by, by the pricking of my thumbs. So we still have a lot of good, good stuff ahead of us. And what I've been really struck by is that the quality kind of, and obviously quality is such a subjective thing, but the quality is, as I perceive it, really um, goes back and forth throughout her career almost. I mean, yes, we have that amazing run in the 30s and the early 40s of, of like probably some of her best books, but there are some within there, you know, Dumb Witness, Murder is Easy, which I'm not oh, as- Oh, hang on, Kemper, <laughs> hang on. Murder is Easy is brilliant. I, you know, I, I knew that you were, I was, I was almost told <laughs> a little bit because I could tell from your book that you were a big fan of that one. But, um, you know, one, two buckle my shoe. Anyway, my, my point is- Yeah, yeah, okay, give me that one. It's a, bit, it's a bit more varied and up and down than people think. And rather than a steep decline, I think, yes, yeah, sure, maybe earlier in the career, a lot more of the gems or what people think of as the gems. But I'm just curious if, if you agree with that and also why you think that is. I mean, why we have this kind of that, that peppered almost sensation if you go through it in chronological order when it comes to you know, what might be perceived as a, as a stronger work or, or not so strong of a work. Yeah, it's really interesting. I completely agree with you. Because I think some of the later, I mean, The Pale Horse, you know, not in the way that we're talking about with Five Little Pigs. I think that's got a claim to be her best book. I really do. I think The Pale Horse is unbelievable. The layers of plotting that have gone into that and always with that ease and always with the, the Macbeth theme going through it and, you know, unbelievable. Um, I also really love at Bertram's Hotel because I think it's such a joke on the Agatha Christie persona. Um, <laughs> you know, the hotel, the 19, you know, the Edwardian, oh, all the tropes of Agatha and hang on, it's all, uh, you know, it's all con. I love that. I think it's amazing that she wrote that. Endless Night, I think Matthew Pritchard has said that's his favorite. That's the, you know. Um, so I completely agree with you that the quality, I think her worst book is The Clocks, but that's just my opinion. Um, I agree with you about Dumb Witness. Uh, yeah. What is, is it when they've, I, I really haven't thought about this. I mean, obviously if you've got to churn one out every year, they are, they can't all be. Um, and then there were now something conceptual at the heart of them. But they, or when they, is it, is, uh, what is conceptual at the heart of Dumb Witness? Nothing. That could have been written by a lot of people. Yes, it's quite generic. It's generic. Um, well, it's, also, <laughs> it's, it's repetitive, which is like the, in the worst, in the worst Christie's, I think they seem padded out. Yeah, yeah. Um, another one. What would? Uh, but when they've got, when they've got something like either they all did it, or it was suicide, or the policeman did it, or the child did it, or no, you know, or the ABC murders, or something like that. When there's something that, that, that beautiful simplicity at the heart of it, um, rather than some of them, I suppose, just strange of the generic. I mean, one, two buck on my shoe, I, I don't mind it, but it, what, it just turns on it being the most unlikely person or whatever. Um, and why did he bring them in to look at the case in the first place? I always wondered that one. <laughs> <laughs> you 
you know, just leave it. But um, Body in the Library, there's got there's something conceptual, Toiles Yeux is something conceptual. Um, some of them just stray into generic detective fiction territory, I suppose, because why? Because I suppose it's just too much to expect that over 66 novels, everyone would have a, a coup at the heart of it. I don't, I, I don't know if I can come up with a, a more, you know, a, a more brilliant answer than that. I mean, what, what do you think? I, when no, you I, I, them, yeah. I honestly don't know why I was asking. I actually think that the, the, your, your simple, straightforward answer is probably the right one, which is just that, <laughs> You know, and I think sometimes we forget 66 novels is 66 novels like that is, yeah. you know, to write even 66 novels, all of which function successfully as novels and they all do, as we were saying, I mean, she always passes the readability test or, or you know, uh, I know there are some at the very, very end that might might potentially not not pass that. Um, we 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 constantly bring up Postern of Fate as the, yes. the book we are we are dreading um, most, but um but still, she, you know, she does that. And I think it's probably not fair to expect that they all be brilliant. And maybe it's just more that the ones that are so brilliant, the highs are so high. It's more about, you know, you're punctuating with highs. And I think you're right. The ones that we might say are are weak or not good Christie are simply her doing what other people did just as well as they did it um, because she wanted to, you know, uh, put books out there uh, consistently year after year, but okay, you know, you that's that, that that's what one does if one wants to be an extremely productive writer. So it's perhaps just a numbers issue, right? It's it's just the fact that there are so many of them. Um, it's just I think the 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 greater point is just that you know it doesn't this story of. Uh, of this massive decline or any sort of noticeable or, or discernible mm -hmm. grand pattern to in terms of quality um, I don't think really holds up to a to a close reading so I just I think that's really interesting yeah no I re no I really don't think that it's interesting I can see why people say I mean Poston of Fate yes it, it, you know it's um, her mind was fragmenting a bit toward the end as you know and um, they Roslyn very much didn't want it published and hence they moved on to Curtain as you know because she'd run out of steam but Nemesis I mean you can when she started dictating them I mean like Halloween Party which I really like but it is prolix you can again you can hear her voice and you can think gosh someone could have snipped away here but it's kind of fascinating in its way um, but I, um, elephants, after Nemesis, I think, yes, elephants can remember is um, a little bit interesting from the point of view of autobiography, I think, but, but yes, but I think to have written Endless Night when she was, what, 76, um, which then would have been older than now, of course, mm -hmm. I mean, it's unbelievable, it's unbelievable, yeah. it's so Getting inside the head, the idiom of a, of a young London guy on the make, you know, there's one or two phrases where you think, no, I don't think he'd say that, but on the whole, my God, it's, it's just fantastic. So I think I completely agree with you about the slight up and down with the, the peak period, as it were, mid thirties to, well, I think up to Crooked House, maybe, um, I think is a, a, a genius book. Um, it's just some of them, I suppose, yes, that's the, that's all I can say is some of them are generic. Some of them could have been written by, I don't know, I can't think of a generic detective writer, but you, but they could have been. I mean, is there anything in Dump Witness other than the dog? Is there anything that makes that kind of Christian? I don't know if I can think of anything. Some people love it, though. We've gotten a lot of pushback for, um, you know, our not, I wouldn't even say distaste, but just not, not our, you know, uh, uh, extreme regard for for dumb witness and uh, you know the dog the the dog element you know her her dog was important to her right and you actually even you riff on her um, her dedication in I think it was the mystery of the blue train which she dedicated to uh, Carlotta and her dog the order order members of the OFD the order of the faithful dog and I noticed that you dedicated this book I have to assume that Vinny is is your beloved 
dog. He was my he was my boy. Yeah. Oh, nice. Well, I'm so glad you picked up on that. Yeah. He yeah. died the year um, that I sort of finished it. Yeah. He was an Italian greyhound. Oh, he was brilliant. So, yes. And when she said that thing about to match, he said, you don't know what it's like to go through a bad time with nothing but a dog to hold on to. You know, that did sort of speak to me. Um, and it, it, so I suppose Dumb Witness is almost, yes, it's almost like a love letter to Peter the dog in a yeah. way. <laughs> But I suppose we're setting very high standards. Yeah. Um, yes. uh, if, if I read the clocks by someone else, I'd probably think, oh, that was quite fun. But um, so, do you, so I'm absolutely, well, I'm obviously going to now listen to your podcast, but I'm so intrigued by this idea of trying to rank them. I mean, that's hard. It's, uh, that, that's why I called it a fool's yeah. errand. <laughs> <laughs> So you actually have categories. So you have the um, the plot credibility one. That's the, yeah, that's hard. I guess. and the and the inappropriate type sort of category, which I can understand. And then you have and and so you do it sort of through blocking up actual points, do you, or do you, yeah. or do you do it on? The, go on, tell me. We divide it into plot mechanics, plot credibility. Yeah. Uh, series long characters, book only characters, setting and tone, and then stuck in its timeness. As yeah, well. yeah, yeah, stuck in its time, yeah, yeah. And the setting and tone is a bit of a catch-all category just for where we're kind of, you know, um, overall writing style and readability and sometimes that ineffable kind of you know this one just feels really special or something like that we can we can kind of cram what we you can need. put x factor in there can you yeah it's a little bit of the the x factor category but yeah it's like two main categories devoted to plot two main categories devoted to character it's a very conventional way of um analyzing christy which sometimes when i sit back and think about it i, I if i had if I had known, I think as much about Christy as as we do now in the you know two thirds of the way through the canon, I might have at least called the category something different because thinking of character and plot in in a conventional way is sometimes missing the point. You know, when it comes to Christy, which is what we've mm -hmm. been talking about, the way that she creates character and you know how the character is informing plot and all of that. I think we managed to you know uh, inform those categories with that that sort of an analysis as, as we're going through now. But um, basically it, it, what I'm saying is it sounds a little bit more basic than, than it actually is, or at least that's, yeah. that's my hope. But um, uh, yeah, it's just, it's really just fun to read Christie closely and then also compare and contrast the books because they, they really do, even though she's, you know, will often have continuity errors and, and stuff like that. It's just oh, yeah. to, to kind of, um, get a, a greater, more holistic sense of her as mm -hmm. a creator of, you know, what we call the, the Christie verse when it comes to all the books she created. They really, you know, the sum becomes greater than its parts in a way. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's been a, a, a fruitful exercise if it's sometimes a bit of a bedeviling one. <laughs> oh God, I'm so envious of you. I really am. Oh God. I think that's such a fun thing to do. And the categories are, you've got to have categories like that, really, haven't you? I mean, you can stretch them and play, play with them and what have you. So you really, really have come down with Five Little Pigs so far. So far, that is, well, we technically have a tie. <laughs> we technically oh. have a tie for first place and last place. That's, that's just Ooh, what I'll, I'll tell you. So our tie for first place is Five Little Pigs and then there are none. But we are yeah. putting Five Little Pigs in first spot. I can see Catherine saying, but Five Little Pigs is in number one spot. Right, Catherine? <laughs> Just be there. <laughs> um, and then our tie for, for dead last place right now is between The Secret of Chimneys and The Big Four. Oh, Christ, yeah, I forgot The Big Four. <laughs> <laughs> big That's Four, you have to excuse because she just, um, yeah, dis disappeared. Yeah, okay, The Big Four. I read that once. I have never returned to the big four. No. Secret of Chimneys, I kind of, I don't know. She's so happy when she writes it. Yeah, that book has some stuck in its time issues. Oh God, I'll say. <laughs> you just have to, what can you do? You just have to say, this was the time and luckily that's over. What yeah, else can you do? 
it's, it's important to acknowledge. I think it's it's important to acknowledge because it is such a part of the experience of reading Christie, and you know, you you have to reckon with it as a reader. You don't have to flog her for it necessarily as a write as a writer because also what's the point? She's not she's not around anymore. So that's you know she's not going to. It's not like we're looking for her to change anything. We wouldn't ever want to change anything. But you know, it is important to acknowledge it. So sure, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 an interesting one. It is an interesting one. So, well, I can't really quarrel with your um, <laughs> your ranking system. I think that sounds pretty okay, actually. Yeah, I think they've come out. Um, I, I, I would definitely put in. You say the hollow is quite high up there, um, and yeah, the hollow is quite high. I mean, we've got a, a lot of the the usual suspects that you would imagine: murder of Roger Ackroyd, the murder on the Orient Express is up there. Um, but a crooked house is extremely high, as is the hollow, and uh, death on the Nile is also within our within our top ten. So, yeah. so we've talked for nearly two, for two hours, and I disagree with you about one thing, which is murder is easy. <laughs> I I I'm glad that we ultimately got there because I I'm I'm telling you I knew as I was as I was sort of like writing up notes for this interview, I was like, wow, she really likes Murder is Easy. That's I do. I'm so shocked that you don't like Murder is Easy. I'm so shocked. It's very <laughs> atmospheric. It, yes. I, I don't know. It's one of those books that when you talk about it, it all sounds great. And it has a, a the way in, which is so often the case with Christy too, that her way into novels is just fantastic. She knows how to yeah. hook you like yeah. no one else, you know? Um, and that even goes, I would argue, for Destination Unknown and Hickory Dickory Dock, which are, you know, the two recent novels we covered, ne neither of which did very well in our rankings, but The Way sure. In is just fantastic. Um, yeah. And Murder is Easy is one of the best way-ins, I think, of any Christie, actually. I remember when I was reading it for the podcast being like, oh my God, this is, this is going to be amazing. It just, I don't know, it didn't, I, I wasn't convinced, I think, by the character uh, who is the murderer? I'm not going to spoil it. Okay. Okay. Do you get, do you agree with that, Catherine? Or I like Murder Is Easy more than Comfort Us. You do. Um, yeah. You know, it, it goes off the deep end. That's what the ending of it is bonkers. So you know, I mean, but um, but I, I mean, I think it's a fun read. I, I, I don't think it's you know superlative. Agatha, but I, you know, I, I find it like a fun read. I would not be opposed to anybody saying, you know, I read this on the beach and had a very nice time reading it because <laughs> I think it's fun. Yeah. Okay. No, that's it. Yeah. No, it's very nice because oddly enough, it would be in my top 10. So it's very interesting. It's very interesting. And I completely agree with you. Destination Unknown is it's very flawed. I just think it's really interesting. I can imagine now that I can imagine doing an adaptation, changing it quite a lot, and doing a really stunning adaptation. Of that. But you'd have to change it a lot. One of the, the that is actually one of my takeaways from Destination Unknown is that you know because it's one of the few that was has never actually been adapted, right? And that number is fast dwindling as we yeah. now have Death Comes as the End coming out. Yeah. And, um, but um, I think that Destination Unknown could make a really, really interesting um, adaptation, and I think. Yeah crazy that it hasn't been adapted yet and I'm, I'm like almost positive that it will be within five years someone's going to adapt that why wouldn't they exactly exactly i think it, you, but you would have to change it a lot but it could be yeah yeah so um what can i say it's been absolute joy i'm so grateful to you for your lovely words about my book it really means a lot because you know seriously it's it's wonderful to hear um and uh I can't wait to listen to your podcast. Well, you will be gratified to hear your name many, many, many times on the podcast because we really, I mean, we really do use it as, you know, we have a couple of secondary sources that we use over and over and over again. There are, there are some key players in there and you are, you are right there as, as one of them. So it's really helped us kind of elucidate what is so powerful about Christy and like it's, it's helped us form arguments and, uh, you know, also just, gather information about specific books and aspects of her life and it's just it's really been a major contribution to the podcast so thank you well i'm i'm absolutely thrilled about that i mean that's the uh, you know that's that's what you wish for as a biographer um <laughs> and it's no but it's such a great idea i think it's so lovely it's, it's such a fun thing to do it must be a joy to do 
really good fun to do and um i'm absolutely thrilled to have been a part of it so thank you so much much for your time no 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 i've had i've had an absolute ball so this this goes online um for the festival is that how it works or yes yes is it just the podcast 